I share the platform with many international agencies. Uh, many of these platforms are increasingly dominated by actors whose motivations in relation to education are much more closely aligned with making profit and not with education as a welfare sector, which is what we're here to talk about today. So their discussions are very much more around education as an area of trade, education as an area of potential uh, investment and returns, and I'm talking about private equity firms here. The Merrill Lynch Bank of America valued the education sector at something close to four trillion. Who were the beneficiaries of this? Not you, not me, not our children. Essentially, there were three large global publishing firms who they nominated as being the major beneficiaries of uh, trading and education services. Pearson Education. Pearson Education owns the Financial Times. They own examination companies, absolutely, in the UK. Elsevier, which is a very large firm involved in publishing textbooks, publishing tests, academic publishing, and so on. The third one, Informa. And again, a very large publishing firm that, like Pearson Education, is rapidly diversifying around textbook production, around testing production, and so on. And we've also heard how the international agencies, like the OECD, are increasingly setting the agenda or the terms of our engagement in education. But they use words like this, global competitiveness, race to the top, knowledge-based economies, technology and science indicators, and so on. I mean, this is a world that is at one level important, but education surely, surely has to be much more than that. Now, I would say, that the focus on teachers is welcomed. This is really important, and not because the evidence is very clear that it is the teacher who makes the difference to learning, but not under the conditions that the OECD and others have us believe. The country that is the highest performing country on the PISA tests is Finland. Finland is the one country that has very few of the kind of mechanisms that, that are being promoted, for example, like the Gates Foundation. Okay? What Finland has invested in is decent salaries for teachers, good professional development, high levels of investment in education, and that is the return that they actually get. What I think we need is a conversation around governance. And what I think we need is a conversation around um, who gets to make what kinds of decisions about what and where? So what do I mean by governance? Governance is activity like funding, like provision, like who owns buildings. Uh, governance includes policy and it includes regulation. So if the policy is moved upwards or much of the formative uh, frameworks for policy, then that becomes quite an issue for us. The second element of that is, who are the actors and the agents? It might include families, it will include teachers and so on, but it also includes significantly um, other organisations well beyond the, the, the remit of the state. Now, it's not that the state has had it snatched away in some cases, and certainly in England, the state is very busy giving away some of this activity to the for-profit sector. Our government in England worked very hard to try and bring in uh, Pearson education into those actors that are delivering higher education. Um, and many of those actors are very closely involved in the delivery of schooling. KMPG, which is a, a, a big global, global accounting firm, runs a school in London. And you'd have to ask yourself, what are they doing there? Making what kinds of decisions where? Um, what gives them the right to make those kinds of decisions? What gives the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation the right, as entrepreneurs, using their foundations to um, 
enforce, or not enforce, but encourage a focus on the kind of uh, problem that they think is the problem and the kind of solution. So I'm not wanting to discourage foundations, but what we do see, and not just in the education, but also in the health sector, is that there are some groups and individuals who have hugely more power to influence um, more than their role as a democratic citizen. We actually have to force a set of conversations around obligations and responsibilities in what she calls a social connection model. And it's not just the question of the social connections that we're making here in our local communities, which are crucially important, but developing a social connection model that sees that uh, we are connected on this planet, that it matters to the future of the children of this world, the kinds of decisions, the kinds of obligations, the kinds of responsibilities we insist that powerful players take on as a set of responsibilities. In conclusion then, what I want to argue is that what we need is several things, to see governance and the, the moving of, of agenda setting moving upwards um, as crucially important um, as a basis for conversations. We need to also see that governance frameworks are strategically selective of some interests over others. And what we need to do is to look at these policy levers and look at the ways in which we bring some of that decision making closer back down home and control over some of that decision making so that we get the kind of education uh, that we think um, is important for the children um, that we care about. In other words, how do we fill the void between what has occurred uh, around where agendas are set, decisions are made, and the spaces to debate and reshape them? How do we think about what this means for us as professionals and the re new responsibilities on us to take these challenges on? In other words, the relational argument. We as educators are, and we as parents are responsible not just for our children, in our homes or only in our classes or in our schools, but for all of the children that includes uh, in Ghana. There must be, they must be part of a new set of conversations, values and habits within the profession. For we are looking after the future. It's ours and the future of the next generation. And it's what connects us all as human beings. We need to put the importance of education governance models that not just favour, but produce societal, the societal good, as part of the very fabric of our societies and of our conversations. Not to do so would be to fall into the trap that austerity has lay, laid for us, which typically is blaming others. How can we make this kind of conversation and this kind of concern go viral and have real effects for those whose futures are in our hearts, but which we need more firmly in our hands? Thank you.